Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Kara Crossweight Brendel. Kara is a licensed mental health therapist in private practice in Denver, Colorado. She holds various roles, including financial therapist, TEDx speaker, burnout consultant, author, and professor. Her new book is Understanding Ruptured Mother-Daughter Relationships, Guiding the Adult Daughter's Healing Journey Through the Estrangement Energy Cycle. You can access therapeutic tools for adult daughters at estrangementenergycycle.com. Without further ado, we're going to dive into this episode with Kara. I am so excited to welcome Kara Crossweight Bindle to the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Where about do you live in the on the planet? <laughs> <laughs> That's a valid question for a podcast, right? Uh, I'm in the Denver metro area of Colorado, so USA. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah, I've been to Denver a few times and recently because I did a competition there. Um, I'm trying to remember if I can remember the name of the high school I was at. I do remember I went to a 24 hour fitness while I was there. <laughs> Those are very popular here. Yes. Uh-huh. And there was a really cool gym I went to the time before, but it I, I cannot remember if it was, I know it said Denver. I think I have a hat. It's pink, of course, from that, <laughs> from, from the gym that I went to, I thought it was Denver bodybuilding and fitness or something like that. Do you go to the gym mm-hmm. there? I do not. I have a two-year-old at home. So that is my gym at this point is going to the parks and walking around and always in motion with her. No Uh, formal gym for me right now, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, that's a gym of its own. Yeah, exactly. My daughter, uh, well, my granddaughter is two and my grandson is one. Oh yeah, you know what this energy is like. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Close together. I'm getting ready to visit and partake in that energy and so you know the mother daughter grandmother granddaughter you know all of the uh the bond is so crucial I was just talking to somebody today that was saying how how close she was to her grandmother more so than her mother and I had the same experience and I find our topic today that we're going to dive into to be very interesting how these things transact, how my granddaughter is so much like me and my daughter is <laughs> my daughter is so much like my mother. Oh. Mm-hmm. And so it's just like this evolution, this whole cycle. Uh but of course, mother daughters can have painful relationships and I will say you know yeah yeah like I could I can be right in there with you on this topic (laughs) (laughs) it's close to home I see yes I hear that a lot actually Mm -hmm. so what what brought you into talking about mother daughter estrangement like that being a topic for you yeah so I'm a mental health therapist here in Colorado so a lot of what informed this book was client work most of the people I work with are women of all different backgrounds you know all the way from like 19 years old to like 65 depending on what they came in to work on and so over the last 12 years I was noticing a pattern where these women would come in with trauma they'd have other relationship stressors just life stuff right coming into therapy And then there seemed to be this pattern with mom, like that they all had a different contentious relationship with mom that they were just trying to heal or fix or make better. And so it led to a lot of like deep therapeutic work. Um, So from all that, it was an estrangement energy cycle, watching them go through these eight stages that were kind of predictable, no matter what their background. And what would you say, like, some people probably don't understand that at all, because they have the best relationship with their mom their mom was their best friend she took them to lunch she was their cheerleader 
in their corner and took them to every dance class and every practice. And then there's the others of us that really uh, didn't experience the emotional support of the nurturing, the uh, just that it's it's like a ruptured mother daughter relationship, and perhaps the mother didn't have it with her mother, and I think it can just go on and on like that. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, what I mean, there's there's so many books out there that kind of capture what you're naming just now, which is like a legacy trauma of like if grandma and mom didn't have a good relationship, does that change how mom and her daughter have a relationship and so on and so forth? Uh, one of our colleagues wrote a book called The Mother Daughter Puzzle, which actually encourages people to map out their family tree a little bit so they can see patterns and behavior. They can see if they had, you know, fights with mom where that might have originated with grandma. And it's really fascinating to think about. And so I, this is where I love memoirs, right? When we think about books, because there's plenty of memoirs that are like, here's a horrible relationship with my mom, or here's abuse, here's trauma, here's neglect. Um, and so I think it opens up our viewpoint a little bit that there isn't just the healthy mother-daughter relationship. There's also on the other end, the unhealthy mother-daughter relationship. So this book felt like a love letter to adult daughters who didn't feel seen. who we were like, hey, everyone's telling me this is really important to have a healthy relationship with mom. I desperately want a healthy relationship with mom, but it's not happening. So it's usually mom stuff. Maybe it's mental health stuff. Maybe it's, you know, a, a cycle of abuse. And so they're, they're coming into therapy saying, what's wrong with me? When really it might just need to be normalized, i.e. the cycle to say, hey, this, is sub this isn't all yours to hold. Someone else has to hold this too. In this case, mom. Oh, right, right. Because it isn't just one person's fault, just like any, any relationship. What assumptions about estrangement need to be dispelled? Like people have certain notions about, I guess that it's their fault uh, or that they were the black sheep or the scapegoat or mm -hmm. that they're, that it's somehow they blame themselves for the having, not wanting to be around their mother. Their mother is draining. Their mother criticizes them says something about their weight oh I'm glad to see you lost 10 pounds or just mm -hmm. nothing ever good enough type thing yeah absolutely so you know when you say that I think of other titles like will I ever be good enough daughters of narcissistic mothers or adult children of emotionally immature parents like there's a reason these two books are bestsellers because people are like I'm craving some information to say that I'm okay um, so assumptions, I mean, the biggest assumption that people have is that this is impulsive and easy on adult daughters. And it absolutely isn't. No daughter that I've worked with was like, this is fun for me. In fact, they're usually in grief and loss. They're usually in pain. There might be a little bit of relief because they're no longer in this like trapped pattern with mom, but it comes at the loss of a relationship they're not going to have, right? They start to grieve the potential of a healthy relationship. So that's a big assumption of like, this is impulsive. This is adult daughter being selfish and that's all just super painful and awful other assumptions are things like I'm holding your grandchildren hostage from you if I'm estranged from you uh, it's my mental health as adult daughter that's the problem um, you know that it's petty that it's a power play that the, the memories you have of trauma aren't real so there's like lots of really heavy unhelpful assumptions 10 of which I attack in the book and say hey Here's another way to look at this. Like, this isn't helpful to adult daughter to say these things about her. So, boy, you, you definitely, I got to backtrack here, hit a lot of things. That, <laughs> yeah, that sorry, I, that, I do that a lot. <laughs> that, that I was thinking about recently because my mom is in the hospital and, uh, you know, just playing back things, realizing that earning her approval was so hard mm -hmm. I'm sure she loved me but just in her own way she had a uh, basically manic depression and mm -hmm. uh struggled with that and was suicidal different you know so it wasn't like as stable of a home as it might have appeared Right. My dad was like the rock. And of course, my mom was good. I don't want to say she's not. 
but there was that dynamic that mm -hmm. dynamic in there and I think I didn't feel things like emotional support um uh, like that mom that wants to take you out to lunch or go to your games and equally that it wasn't okay to be myself but that mm -hmm. I had to follow her what what the narrative was my brother could do no wrong though he didn't really do that much mm -hmm. like like I knocked myself out into to adulthood and really didn't recognize that I was trying to earn love because that's what I was taught. Love is hard to get. You have to earn it. And no accolade I achieved was ever enough. Like I finally realized that she wasn't going to give me that approval that I was seeking. And I, I did, it was such a healing experience, which I'm still, still healing from, uh, is, is gaining that approval. Mm -hmm. And realizing if somebody isn't giving you approval, it gives them more power and control not to do that. And how do you, what do you do with that? You start to give the approval that you, you should have received. Like mm -hmm. you already are approved. You, you don't need somebody's approval to, uh, find that within yourself that you are enough that you are right. that you are good enough that you are worthy of approval mm -hmm. and so what you're speaking to there is like attachment trauma right which is like this like mother-daughter bond is so strong we hear about it in like psychology classes and education of like this is so important and then when it's not healthy or when they're not available emotionally or physically they're just not part of your life it's so painful right which is why I think a lot of women are craving this conversation of like am I okay am I loved unconditionally can I have approval about who I am do I have self-worth uh, so a lot of the work that these women were doing in therapy revolved around these topics of like who am I without my mom if she's not a part of my life what kind of mother do I want to be if I want to be a mother or am a mother what, what's my self-worth if she's not telling me wear this, eat that, lose weight, go into this profession, marry this type of person. So there's so much there that people that are listening right now can probably relate to. So what's, what would you say separates these stages in the parental estrangement experience? Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, when we call it the estrangement energy cycle, what I like to explain is like, I picked the word energy because sometimes it's all in our head as we anticipate an estrangement from our parent. So sometimes it's just the thought of like, what is this going to look like if I play this through? And then sometimes we're actually in it, right? So we've actually moved through the stages. Most of these women have an experience where they recognize that the behavior of their parent towards them was neglectful, abusive, or traumatic. That's like the catapult into the cycle of like, oh, once I know that I can't unsee it, and then I have some questioning that shows up naturally as stage two, which is what do I want to do with this information? Do I want to talk to my parent about it? In this case, mom, do I want to ignore it? Do I want to pretend it's not there? Do I want to like focus on the relationship we have now versus my childhood? More often than not, a lot of these women just want approval, acceptance, and an apology. Like, I just want my mom to look at me and say, I messed up and I could have done better and I'm so sorry. I'll do better from here. And that's what we fantasize about as adult daughters, right? It's like, I just want to hear that. I could crave that. And if we're lucky, if they do that, then we heal. Now we're out of the cycle completely. But as you can imagine from my face right now, like more often than not, it moves us into a relationship rupture. So if daughter asks mom these questions, hey, mom, why were you this way? Why were you not available? Why did you focus on my brother, but not myself? Why were you never at my games? Why didn't we go out to lunch? And she responds poorly now estrangement is possible. So those are just the first four stages of eight right there, which leads to this emotional experience for women. So I hear what you're saying because that I experienced some of the things you just <laughs> yeah. said. Yeah. And, but I think I've 
I've started really, I've really made my peace with it. My mom is older. There's no way Mm -hmm. my, my mom could handle me asking her the questions that came up as I grew up and raised my own children and realized, oh, why, why, you know, all the questions of why, but why did you guys allow my, my abuser from the age of eight to sit at every holiday table with me, you know, Mm -hmm. like, why was that? Okay. That taught me that, uh, I'm not worthy of being protected. Mm -hmm. And I seen a lot of these things that happened show up in my life. And now I have to deal with the aftermath of learning. How do I, put boundaries in place when I may not even know what they sh- they should be or how to how to realize I'm worthy of these boundaries because they weren't they weren't set for me and I w- I just really have struggled with setting boundaries in my adult life Oh yeah. I mean that you are not alone in that. I mean, boundaries is something therapists love to talk about all day, every day. Right. So as you say that, it's like you had no role model of what a healthy boundary was. If you're like, my perpetrator was at the table every holiday or mom was not emotionally available or whatever that looked like. It's really confusing to set a boundary when no one showed you how it's done. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and and it just basically everybody else got a pass, Mm -hmm. but I didn't like get a pass. Like if, if somebody did something, it was always something I should do better. Mm-hmm. And I carried that into every relationship that, you know, what could I do better? What did I do wrong? What, what? And so I, I see these things, our mothers affect, uh, our mother daughter relationship affects us greatly. And But then on the other regard, I can see that being the scapegoat made me incredibly strong. And I don't, I'm, I'm capable and I'm glad I wasn't the golden child because the golden child received uh, approval when doing nothing. Like, so then how can they measure uh, what? they should be doing like it's just it's not good it's not a good balance for either child yeah well and I think what you're speaking to is there are a couple terms in therapy that it sounds like you've done a lot of your work so this will resonate post-traumatic growth and resiliency right of like I went through something so hard that I've actually become a stronger more resilient person because of it and so the last four stages of our cycle are really about that journey for people who haven't got there yet, who haven't done their own work, who are like, I'm in the thick of it. I'm feeling the grief and loss and feeling lost in general. And so once we pursue estrangement from mom, I mean, for your listeners, there are people who will reconcile and there are people who this is permanent, right? I'm like, I'm not talking to mom. And regardless, in the moment of picking estrangement, grief and loss shows up. It's grief and loss for what could have been. It's grief for the mom I wish I'd had. It's grief for the milestones where mom might not be present, like marriage, children, illness, new job, stuff like that. So that's the fifth stage. Sixth stage is that discovering sense of self that you've done so well. Like, who am I without her? Who am I on my own? Standing on my own two feet. Who do I want to be? So that soul searching can show up in therapy or just on your own or through journaling or working out, whatever your meditative process Mm -hmm. is. And then the deeper work is, you know, therapist's personal favorite because it can lead to, aha, I didn't realize I was this way in my romantic partner relationships or hmm, here's uh-huh. a pattern with my children that I want to be aware of, right? So it like leads to some like aha moments for the woman. And last but not least is redefining that self-worth. So where am I headed from here? If mom is a part of my life, how do I want to show up? If she's not a part of my life, how do I want to show up? And so those I think are the healing stages mm-hmm. for the whole cycle where women go, I'm going to be okay. Versus in the middle of estrangement, I don't feel okay. It's very emotional, very painful. And I will say it, I listened to a whole episode recently of the golden child and the scapegoat and how those roles can play out in your adulthood because 
you were conditioned for them. You're being a people pleaser. Uh, you're trying to control the dynamics. You want to keep everyone happy. And you're putting yourself last on that list. Mm. And I just think like, it's very eye opening. If you were either of these things today, anybody listening, when you start to see how you're accepting that role in a romantic relationship and it's it's kind of life changing when you see it and it's so odd that the day i listened to this video and it was believe me the ahas were going on <laughs> and i was like oh my gosh and then my mom went in the hospital and i mm -hmm. had a terrible uh just grieving of of i think realizing that what you were wanting is not going to ever happen like because yeah. it's getting close to the end and you have this grieving of just this recognition it's like you realize even though i'm 61 <laughs> i am still that little girl that wanted her mother's approval and wanted to feel that she was good enough and that being herself was okay more than okay and so when you recognize that the ship may have sailed it, it is a grieving for that loss of what you were hoping for at that but yet never really i don't know if i want to say achieved but received would be the word yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is so relatable in the sense that in the book, I have nine women's stories that like kind of capture all of the energy of what this looks like. And we go through each of their stories through all, all eight stages. And one of them that I named Nina in the book, every year she questions, should I talk to mom? Should I try again? And she goes through another grief and loss response of what if I never get the chance? What if she never says sorry? Like there's this fantasy that we all have, which is this craving for mom to say, I'm sorry, and I'll do better. And so I think that was maybe part of your journey that you just shared of like, oh, the time is running out. A lot of people will tell us, oh, you should just talk to your mom because what if she dies? What if she dies tomorrow? And so it's this really complicated emotional roller coaster of the what ifs. If I try to get back together with mom and talk to her, is that harmful or helpful to me as adult daughter? Will she say the things I desperately want to hear from a healing perspective? Or is it just going to make it worse? And then we're right back in the cycle all over again. That's the big question. If I start to talk to her, we try to reconcile, will it be okay? And I will say, I didn't really have estrangement like what you're talking about, but maybe a sort of type. I just yes. remember one day showing her something and my brother came in really loud and I thought, oh, you know, the moment's gone. I was showing her some competition I won or something. Mm -hmm. And, but that wasn't it. I thought that, <laughs> that he just, that was it. But then I remember showing her, oh, mom, I was an insider, Thrive Global and, and on Bull TV. And she was like, so, and, you know, mm -hmm. it was very she's older. So I tried to take it with a grain of like, mm, no filter, but maybe a little, maybe a little dementia. Cause I don't think my mom in the past would have said that, but mm -hmm. yet it stung. And it, and it wasn't, I still wasn't recognizing that I was killing myself for her approval until I remember seeing her down at the table telling her something so they wouldn't have to worry some accolade that most people would never achieve in their lifetime and she was like how'd you get that oh, I'm gonna have to think about that like it was like I was like we were criminals or something like you know mm -hmm. and it was eye-opening it was I I was like oh I have been killing myself for my mother's approval and I never ever recognized why 
I am an achiever, why I had such a need for achievement, why after one thing, after the other, after the other, and then I, I finally recognized it. And I will say that that's when healing began. Yeah. And I had to back away from my mom for a little bit. I I did. I definitely backed away. I definitely had to take my my break. But space. I come full circle where I don't I think I'm on the end of seeing that she did her her best as my mom and who knows what their I I mean I my grandma and I were close but who knows what her parenting was like who knows what her dad was like or the pressures of being a teacher's child and being a valedictorian and you know just mm-hmm. so I gave her I I just forgave her I just mm-hmm. gave her a pass and uh work on the things and try to recognize when I'm falling into the roles from childhood. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the people pleasing, the perfectionism, the high achievement, the, you know, being the doormat to other people's wants and needs. Like there are some themes of, yeah, (laughs) there's some themes here that people and listeners are going to resonate with. Of Like a lot of the women I worked with were highly sensitive people to HSP in the sense that they can read people very quickly. And part of that was survival if they were in an abusive, traumatic environment. Of like I got to read mom's emotions and if she's happy I stay engaged and if she's unhappy I'm hiding in my room I mean like they, I had a client describe it as she would listen for the sound of the car door and how it sounded would tell her to either hide or stay present when her mom walked in the door because she was so tuned into mom's mood that if she heard it slam she was hiding making herself scarce but if she heard it close gently that was an invitation to stay connected to mom which is just heartbreaking right that you have young children learning how to do that and then it catapults us into the adult behaviors of perfectionism, pressure, workaholism, all the things I love to talk about because there is a connection, as you named. Well, I think that's why I've always been able to read the room. And somebody thinks they're hiding something, but I know like right away. Yeah. And I think that that really connects back to just when you're in an unstable environment, you're trying to make everything safe. And it's why I always want to fix, like, I want to fix things. I want mm. to everyone to be happy around me because ha- being happy means you're safe. I, yeah. I see that now, but like, I don't think I recognized why that was so important. And mm-hmm. now I realize it's not my responsibility Right. And right. I, and I try to not, I try to get to that point where I'm like, oh, oh, when that person is like that, that is not my responsibility. That is their responsibility. I don't need to take it upon myself and I don't have to, I can't fix them. Right. And it kind right. of absolves you of responsibility of, right. Of like, I'm healing myself. So I don't have to give my all to other people. There's an image that usually comes up for me, which is two people made out of bricks and one person is taking bricks from their own leg to build the other one up. And so that's this feeling of like, I am literally giving you my energy, my essence to make you a better person, to make you happy, to make you feel good. But at the cost of, I don't have a leg now, (laughs) or I don't have energy, you know, all these things that come from that. So I think listeners can relate to a lot of what we shared. And I wanted to come back to something, which is there are two types of estrangement. And you were naming that earlier by saying, well, I still talked to my mom, but I took some emotional space from her. And so we have physical estrangement, which is what most people think of, which is this hard stop. We don't talk. I don't see you. You don't know what my life is like. I don't see you at holidays, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's also emotional estrangement, which is the slow distancing of I'm not going to call you as often. I'm not going to see you as often. I'm going to shorten the holiday visit. I'm going to put some space and boundaries between us, but you're still part of my life. So I I think from what you've shared that there was more of the emotional estrangement for you of like, I'm protecting myself from this energy. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I I mean, there was several things in between there. I I just tried not to make it too personal where, (laughs) (laughs) where I finally was just like, okay, I'm getting this. I'm getting this. And the people pleasing, the uh, 
people pleasing to the detriment of yourself like what you said uh, just a few minutes ago uh recognizing that you're doing that and then how how do people stop doing that like where they're pe you know people pleasing to the detriment of themselves I, is that part of the uh you're not worthy of being protected part like what is that dynamic yeah yeah, I mean, I think each person's story is unique, but a phrase that I write into the book from some of these women, like a common theme I heard is, if I'm not good enough, I, I'm not deserving of love, right? So it's like, I want unconditional love, but I don't think I'm lovable. And to make myself lovable, I might have a learned behavior, which is to take care of your needs, right? So the people please in the Enneagram too, if you're a fan of the Enneagram personality test, like this type of person will bend over backwards to make other people happy hoping that like you named will it'll keep them safe and also will have them feel accepted like they belong because they're attending to someone else it's wild I remember uh Lewis Howe's mom from the school of greatness told me I had good girl syndrome oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, and did, if, <laughs> I, I didn't I did not get it until I got it and I was like yeah oh I was gonna say like there's a right. book that came out last March um that's had like it was called the good daughter syndrome so you should read it <laughs> yeah uh, thank you it's very connected to what we're talking about but oh I totally. that layer of absent parent or narcissistic parent or borderline parent and just like oh I have to show up and I have to be good I have to be quiet I have to wear what she tells me to wear I have to have the job she wants and it's just really powerful that book I recommend it so I still probably struggle with saying that that is the case with thinking like really maybe not but then I look at the similarities and I'm like oh oh yeah that did go on oh I did feel that way oh when I was pregnant and hungry and came to the house to pick up probably she was babysitting one of my kids literally she had made muffins and she was saving them for my brother and mm -hmm. I couldn't have any <laughs> He was still sleeping until noon. And so that was a very, like, that is the epitome of things that went on growing up. Yeah. And then I, so you can't look away. You're like, oh, that did, that is, oh. Or triangulation where uh, she would pit family members, you know, them against me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just the blaming and the shaming and the guilting. So I, I don't know if it was a large scale, but it was a scale and I ha I can't unsee it now that I've seen it. And then now I see how the dynamic played throughout. And I think that that is very freeing and that we can heal from, from this type of thing. But I think it goes on more often than not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the reasons I felt motivated to write this book is I wanted to be one of many voices for some of these adult daughters. There were lots of books out there for the parents who were angry and bewildered and, you know, flabbergasted that they were being estranged from by their children. And they had all these questions and there were lots of people addressing their questions, but there weren't as many voices saying, adult daughter, is this you? Is this your experience? Do you feel seen? Do you feel validated? Do you feel heard? Um, so that's one of the reasons among many why I think this book came to fruition. The scene validated and heard. Oh, that is so, you're going to have to hear my talk that I did <laughs> in, the, in, in New York. It was uh, before I lifted one finger is the title. But mm -hmm. if you go onto my Instagram, you'll find it. Basically, I'll definitely look for it. It was saying those things, being seen, heard, validated, that we were already worthy before we lifted one finger and we didn't Beautiful. have to prove our worth. And it just goes into the whole dynamics. And that was such a healing experience, uh, just diving into that, because I know there are so many of us out there that have had very similar circumstances if it wasn't with your mother, it might've been your father mm -hmm. and you could have, you know, it could be dynamics in the family 
It could be a grandmother, a grandfather, you know, any kind of relative that has, you know, had an effect. I think though, long-term, you, you also have to just be able to recognize where we can pick up from there and move on and heal and forgive and I guess hope others. Yeah, that you're doing that. I'm doing that through this podcast. We're doing it. But like someone's going to take the nuggets of what we've shared and say, oh, I'm not alone. I'm mm -hmm. not abnormal. I didn't not do enough. I did the best I could. Like there's so many different dynamics here and histories and traumas that we can say aren't yours to hold. And I think that's very healing too. What would you say the social stigmas are attached to this mother daughter estrangement? You know, I think it, it, it boils back to like this impulsivity. I keep hearing that this was like at the drop of a hat that daughter told mom, I don't want to talk to you or see you. And we know that's not true. We know it's like years or months in the making depending on the circumstance of what brought them here um we kind of talked about this earlier but like there's lots of societal expectations about family first or you should talk to your mom or you're going to regret it right it's so like there's a lot of messages towards these women that they are doing the wrong thing by estranging so i would like to like clear the air there and say each person has to do what's best for them for their safety their mental health their physical well-being and to say, oh, you're going to regret this is not helpful. Right. And some some children like come from a family where the mother was very narcissistic and all the daughters know it. Mm -hmm. And it was all about the way they look, the weight that they weigh, uh, being perfect because they were an extension of their mother. And so they That's better... Right be representing her well and i think i've seen the sting and many women that have come through my doors at the sisterhood of sweat where mm. this there's a mother wound it's it's either because of that type of arrangement where you're representing your representative of your mother mm -hmm. uh and like she's a perfectionist and so you're just being you know, drilled to be perfect. But there's, mm -hmm. you know, the other regard of people that have mothers that abandon them, really. And not mm -hmm. necessarily that they put them in a orphanage or something, but they were totally abandoned. Abandoned for men, abandoned um, just emotionally and every other way. And that mm -hmm. affects women so greatly uh, with their value of because they weren't being valued early on. So they get in these uh, relationships with men and they're very promiscuous some, uh, you know, sometimes because they're, they don't know their value and they're trying to find it through somebody else. And mm -hmm. It's just this onslaught of being this abandonment by your mother, how it affects you in so many areas. So what would you speak to women today that have gone through something like that uh, so they can understand their value? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a process. So we can normalize that it's like not overnight that all of a sudden you say, I have self-worth or I'm good as I am. But I think a lot of people come into spaces like the space you offer or therapy or community or sisterhood or something to heal. It doesn't have to be a solo, I'm all alone kind of experience. I think there is something very healing and powerful about community, whether it's other women or building their chosen family, if their family of origin is, is not healthy. Um, so I would hope that listeners would feel motivated to say, let me be vulnerable and connect with other people that might be part of the healing journey could be a professional like a therapist could be a community of women yeah I, I again like they're I think because they didn't get that instilled they're struggling in their adulthood to recognize that they're valuable yeah and so having other people outside of the family network 
say you're valuable. You're my friend. I appreciate you. I love you. I care for you. I mean, I talk about that in the book as well of like, here's what you can do as a partner of someone who's going through estrangement. Here's what you can do as a sibling. Here's what you can do as a community member, kind of the do's and don'ts. Don't say they're going to regret it. Do be there for them. Do encourage them to talk about it if they want to. Um, but having those healing spaces of community, whatever that looks like to a woman, I think is crucial. Well, it's very crucial to have female support. Uh, a, the support of a therapist can help you greatly to see things you don't recognize. Maybe you're doing to yourself because they were done to you growing up. And again, I think it can be a complete healing journey so that you don't have to carry this with you forever and mm -hmm. you can heal from the things that weren't ideal. Uh, this has been so good today. Tell us the name of your book and where everybody can get this. Yeah, absolutely. So it's called um, Understanding Ruptured Mother-Daughter Relationships. It's, the subtitle is Guiding the Adult Daughter's Journey Through the Estrangement Energy Cycle. So Really, the focus is the adult daughter. This book is for her. This book is also for the therapists or clinical professionals who serve daughter. Um, and it's available anywhere books are sold. So great. So great. Now, your next book needs to be all about boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm working on my ninth book right now at the time that we're recording. And it's not that, but I do have a little ebook on boundaries because I was like, man, people <laughs> keep asking me about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. Uh, well, I have really enjoyed having you on and this is, you know, a deep topic guys. So it might be triggering to some that are still, still kind of experiencing the aha moments that they never wanted to see. So just take it in bite sized pieces and it's easier that way. Sometimes it's kind of hard when we start really looking at things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I'm allowed to, I would say pick up the book and, and read these nine women's stories that might also bring some heart into it of like, it's one thing to see this cycle and go, oh my gosh, that's me. It's another to hear how women navigated it at every stage to be like, oh, there's hope. There's, you know, there's a plan. There's a possibility that I'm not going to be in this, this feeling forever. So I hope that would help women as well. And the other aspect is kids love their parents it's just for the most part it's just the way that it is you can see people you can see some of the worst parents out there and the kid still has love for their parents and mm -hmm. I think you can see the, the errors that your parents made but still have love for them and so I think this was very uh, eye-opening and very refreshing and I think very healing. So thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. I'm glad we could have the conversation. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Sisterhood of Sweat. Let us know how this resonated. If you have any stories you'd like to tell. And as always, keep on keeping on everybody. Bye everyone.